Okay, so we're going to be taking a look at the 2006 AP English Language and Composition uh, free response question, right? This is the rhetorical analysis question. And uh, I mean, those of you familiar with the AP Language exam uh, know that you have to normally do three essays in two hours. So this is question one from 2006, and we're going to be talking through the prompt first because although most of the prompts are familiar or familiar not only familiar but they're also um, similar they do use some different verbiage in how to uh, go about or what exactly you're looking for but always right rhetorical analysis is we're looking at how the writer is writing what choices does the writer make in order to achieve the purpose so in this one right here, right, the passage below is an excerpt, so it's part of Jennifer Price's recent essay, The Plastic Pink Flamingo, A Natural History. So most of us, I would think, know, I mean, flamingos, if you've been to the zoo, uh, you know flamingos, but maybe you've seen um, the, the plastic pink pink lawn ornament. I mean, I've seen them in the Target bargain bin recently. So one of those things is we are looking at this now, right, as years, decades later, and they actually, you know, have become kind of tacky. So we want to set that aside because this was uh, talking about why were they so popular in the first place. So our thoughts or images of current time thinking they're like cheap, tacky plastic things you can buy at Home Depot or Target and you just stick them in your lawn. They're almost kind of like a, a, a humorous joke even, but we don't want to necessarily bring that in. So the essay examines the popularity of the plastic pink flamingo in the 1950s. Uh, and then if you don't know what those are, you should probably just Google it real quick and then come back. So read the passage carefully as though you're going to read it uh, sloppily or uncarefully. Uh, then write an essay in which you analyze, here's the key then, right? How Price crafts the text to reveal her view of United States culture, right? So what we're looking at is some sort of um, image or um, view or interpretation of what U.S. culture was like, okay? So what we're looking at really is like what rhetorical choices does Price make to paint a picture of the culture, okay? So that's the purpose. Now, in here, we don't necessarily know the audience. We have to kind of just presume maybe it's someone interested in, in um, paraphernalia from the culture, in trends in the culture, in American culture at least. But uh, the purpose right here is to kind of give a, a viewpoint or an interpretation of, of what was going on in the United States history and the culture that would make these pink flamingo lawn ornaments so popular. Right, so that's the task at hand, and that's what we're going to be looking for as we read through this. So as we get into a prompt, uh, a couple things we have to think of. Number one, right, this is ultimately a, a timed essay. So I have to make my writing task manageable. Uh, in that sense, we, we talk about that rhetorical shift that somewhere in this passage, the author will either pivot or move on to a, another point. Um, and there could be two of those, there could be three of those. And so I want to, as I read through, right, look for that rhetorical shift and try to find different ideas or um, issues that the author might explore. What that does for me is it gives me a way to talk about uh, a couple different things in the essay. If I find one rhetorical shift, that means I can spend... Uh, time in one paragraph on what the author is trying to do before that shift. 
And then after the shift, I can spend a second paragraph um, on what the author's purpose is or what the author's trying to do after the shift. So that's kind of why the rhetorical shift is so important, right? Because now as the writer, I can do my intro, I can do a paragraph on what the purpose is or what the author does before the rhetorical shift. I can do a second paragraph on what the author does after the rhetorical shift, and then I can do a conclusion. Now, if I find two rhetorical shifts, if the author kind of talks about one thing and then that leads to another and that leads to another, now I'm talking three paragraphs and I have 40 minutes to do it. So that's about time management. And so that's the recommendation, right? You try to find one shift that you're gonna just kind of stake your claim on and then you're gonna go from there. So let's start off. When the pink flamingo splashed, well, you know, it's a water bird, so that's kind of a little pun, I guess, uh, into the 50s market, uh, finan you know, financial market, not in terms of like the stock market, but, um, you know, what consumers could purchase, it staked two major claims to boldness. Bam, right there, two claims to boldness. So perhaps... I'm gonna focus on one of those claims to boldness and a second one. And then that whole word right there in the first sentence, boldness, uh, is this author going to be talking about the boldness of American culture possibly? Um, why is the flamingo a symbol of boldness? Uh, and what about American culture was bold? So let's move into it then. First, it was a flamingo. Since the 1930s, vacationing Americans had been flocking. There's another pun because the birds are in flocks. All right. To Florida and returning home with souvenirs. In the 1910s and 20s, Miami Beach's first grand hotel, the Flamingo, had made the birds synonymous with wealth and pizzazz. Later, developers built hundreds of more modest hotels to cater to an eager middle class served by new train lines. And in South Beach especially, architects employed the playful art deco style replete with bright pinks and flamingo motifs. So where did this start off with, right? It started off in with the wealthy uh, class in uh, kind of this grand hotel, right? So this idea of... Uh, the wealthy kind of setting uh, the goal or the tone and then uh, vacationing Americans like, you know, they're wowed by this. And so the middle class uh, kind of consumes the trend that the upper class uh, establishes. And so they, you know, they go and they see these ex this expensive hotel and it's glitzy and, and it symbolizes wealth and they want a piece of that pie and they bring it back with them to their middle class life, right? So there's that idea already that uh, the boldness is like tied to wealth perhaps. And so that could be something we could explore, okay? This was a little ironic since Americans had hunted flamingos to extinction in Florida in the late 1800s for plumes, which would be feathers, and meat. That's an interesting little historical fact, right? This was once a, a common bird, like a chicken maybe, uh, except you know we don't necessarily wear chicken feathers as, as kind of something uh, uh, fashionable, but people ate flamingos, they hunted them to extinction. So here was a bird now symbolizing like wealth and pizzazz and extravagance, and it started off as uh, meat. Okay, so, and then they go on to say, but no matter, in the 1950s, new interstates would draw working class tourists too. So you can see like this trickle down. Here's the wealthy uh, upper class with their posh hotel. And then uh, vacationing middle class would go and be like, whoa. And then the middle class would become common. And then it trickles down to even working class tourists coming down. And so it became the symbol of wealth even was became something to them, right? Back in New Jersey, the Union Products Flamingo inscribed one's lawn emphatically with Florida's cachet of leisure and extravagance. So this, you know, striving for the symbols of, 
of wealth and boldness. So you can see it goes down to even the, the, the more poor aspects of society. The bird acquired an extra fillip of boldness too from the direction of Las Vegas, the flamboyant oasis of instant riches that the gangster Benjamin Bugsy Siegel had conjured from the desert in 1946 with his Flamingo Hotel. Anyone who has seen Las Vegas knows that a flamingo stands out in the desert even more strikingly than on a lawn. In the 1950s, namesake flamingo hotels, restaurants, and lounges cropped up across the country like a line of semiotic sprouts. So there we have then this instant promise of wealth from Vegas also putting this flamingo on display. So it, it, we can see, right, this idea of I mean, what she's saying about American culture, that if um, her view that there, there's a, a striving for, for wealth, there's a striving for um, like symbolically, uh, like you've made it, that uh, you live extravagantly. So there's some interesting ideas there that you could explore in that first paragraph. And right, then you would have to just define, okay, so what does she has make a, a historical reference, a geogra geographical reference to Las Vegas. So it's these things you can bring in to uh, discuss how she uh, achieves that purpose of describing this, um, this, I guess, pursuit of, of wealth or wanting the symbols of extravagance, wanting to seem that way. Even if you have to go back to your lower class life, you can stake that symbol in your lawn with this pink flamingo. Okay, and then the next one goes, the next part goes on, and the flamingo was pink, a second and commensurate, commensurate claim to boldness. So here's that already, she's telling us right here. So that was the first claim, it was a flamingo. And now we have, it was pink, the second claim. So she actually just kind of says like, hello, look it, I'm moving on to the second one now. And the only thing that's maybe a little tricky is it says and, and usually that means an add-on uh, instead of a word like but or however and moving on to something else. It's not as obvious here, except after she says and the flamingo is pink, she just puts it right out there. This is the second claim to boldness. So the one part is flamingo, and now we're shifting into the second claim about the color pink. And so perhaps when we're talking about before the rhetorical shift and then after the rhetorical shift, we're going to talk about the flamingo and then we're going to talk about pink. So let's move on into the second column. All right. Second column then, we'll finish up with the first because that kind of pushed us here. The plastic industries of the 50s flavored flashy colors, which Tom Wolf called the new electrochemical pastels of the Florida literal. Tangerine, broiling magenta, livid pink, in, incarnadine, fuchsia demure, Congo ruby, methyl green. These things that sound like colors from Home Depot, right? The hues were forward-looking rather than old-fashioned, just right for a generation raised in the Depression, that was ready to celebrate its new affluence. Uh, affluence meaning, right? So it's a, this idea with money, but now there's a different kind of aspect, historically speaking, right? Uh, from the Great Depression, uh, you have this uh, population that now came into money or had money. And so uh, it's this idea of culture being forward thinking. She says right there, it's forward thinking rather than old fashioned. So it's like the striking out with the new boldness and these colors were like, whoa, right? uh, kind of bright and bold. And so there was like this desire to like live bold or live bright, perhaps. Uh, maybe that's something I'll explore. How does the color pink do that would be something to, to, to talk about, right? And as Carol Ann Marling has, was, has written, the sassy pinks were the hottest color of the decade. So a couple, uh, there's a historical reference there. Here's an, a reference to an author describing this. Washing machines, cars, and kitchen counters proliferated in passion pink, sunset pink, and Bermuda pink. Um, and it's funny because you know, as someone who uh, I've, I've lived in two houses that were built in the 1950s in neighborhoods uh, that were in the 1950s and people that didn't update uh, their houses when you went and looked in them to maybe to, to buy them, the bathrooms were pink with a pink toilet and a pink tub. 
And, and we look at that in, in the, the 90s and 2000s, we're like, yeah, that's kind of retro, but it's super uh, dated as well. And this is the idea of this is when this was established. Um, washing machines, cars, and kitchen counters proliferated in Passion Pink, Sunset Pink, and Bermuda Pink. In 1956, right after he signed his first recording contract, Elvis Presley bought a pink Cadillac. So it's this idea of you know those that make it or achieve it. It's it's this Hollywood um, uh, symbol of boldness here with the color. Why, after all, call the birds pink flamingos as if they could be blue or green? Right? It's redundant. Pink flamingo, they're pink. Um, the plastic flamingo is a hotter pink than a real flamingo, and even a real flamingo is brighter than anything else around it. So that's kind of an important line, right? Um, it's this idea of being bigger than life, brighter than life, uh, striving and, and becoming something bigger, perhaps, uh, symbolically, uh, the pink flamingo plastic ornament, uh, is like in color, at least even beyond what the real life version. So, you know, bigger, like you think about Hollywood with, the, with Elvis there in here and that, um, you know. Elvis becomes like this iconic uh, character uh, of, of Hollywood as, as he becomes more and more famous. And so this, uh, you have reality of the, the pink flamingo, which is already bright, uh, this, this uh, bold uh, symbol. And then you have even beyond that, this, this plastic piece is like, um, you know, a, a symbol uh, that's richer and brighter and, and more iconic, more imp uh, of an impression than even the real thing, right? And so perhaps that's something to explore in terms of like um, maybe a little even in faith. Like we, we want to achieve like this uh, maybe unachievable or unrealistic uh, almost uh, caricature of, of, of what's, what's real. There are five species, all of which which feed in flocks on algae and invertebrates and saline and alkaline lakes in mostly warm habitats around the world. The people who have lived near these places have always singled out the flamingo as special. So, you know, that's a kind of an important line. Uh, if this bird is seen as special, what does that say about uh, American culture? What are they trying to achieve? What, what do they want to see themselves as? Um, Early Christians associated it with the red phoenix in ancient Egypt. It symbolized the sun god Ra in Mexico and the Caribbean. It remains a major motif in art, dance, and literature. So no wonder that the subtropical species stood out so loudly when Americans in temperate New England reproduced it, brightened it, and sent it wading across an inland sea of grass. Right. So you have um, these what it symbolized in these different cultures. Uh, you know, the sun god Ra, the red phoenix. Um, and, and so what does it symbolize then? The question there is, what's it symbolizing in American, in American culture? So that's uh, all kind of the pieces that we can, we can use to explore. Um, I just wanted to talk through it. I didn't want to give definite answers because that's for the, the student's mind to come up with. But these are kind of the, the facets that you can explore a little bit and think about. And I wanted to see, you know, after you've read this and you did an, an annotation, did the things I brought up strike you at all? Where were we um, on the same page? And you were like, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, and where were we different? You probably saw some things that I didn't. Now, of course, I have more life experience to draw on. Uh, most of you have not been shopping in a 1950s neighborhood to buy your first home. I've had that experience and I've seen these pinks um, in these houses. So what do you think about this prompt? What, what kind of ideas would you explore uh, in something that maybe you didn't really know much about? And now you have one author's perspective of this plastic flamingo and what it meant to American culture. So good luck.